Wrestling.com proudly presents the Wrestling Is Real Podcast. Because wrestling needs us. Presented by KingofAmazon.com. When you think of Amazon, think KingofAmazon.com. We didn't think AEW was going to grow anymore for all those people on wrestling Twitter that thought that AEW was just going to go ahead and get toppled at the hands of NXT, which is what WWE decided to throw at AEW, you're wrong. Look what happened today. It's as if King of Podcast here, oh, you know what? We're going to put some news out on Wednesday. Put on the press release because it's time for King of Podcasts to do another wrestling with your podcast. Yeah! Here we go. Let's talk about the big news coming out today. Variety.com I'm going to read to right now. All Elite Wrestling is expanding its footprint on TNT. So this is what happened. All Elite Wrestling, AEW has signed a new multi-year deal with TNT and Warner Media that will keep the show on the air, the show Dynamite, on the air through 2023. And they're going to get a second program. The second program will be AEW Dark retooled for television. It will not be necessarily the same as what we see on YouTube every week, but that's the plan. Now, so far, Dynamite launched in October on TNT, and currently, the audience base is averaging 1.2 million viewers per episode, 654,000 adults, 18 to 49, and the Nielsen Live Plus 7 ratings. 1.2 1.2 million viewers on average when you're looking at live ratings along with a seven-day DVR. So people within the seven days from airing to the new show, that's the plan. There we go. Now, Warner Media announced in May 2019 they were working with AEW to build a promotion to a global pro wrestling franchise. And Warner Media has been offering fans exclusive access, access to their pay-per-views via Bleacher Report or Live or BR Live. Next revolution, their next ev- uh, event, excuse me, revolution is on February 29th. It will stream on the platform. And Warner Media's Kevin Rowley broke down what AEW is getting with the new deal and extension. Here's what's happening Kevin Rowley, who is the chief content officer for HBO Max, president of TNT, TBS, and True TV, the president of, the di- of this division, spoke with Variety at the Television Critics Association Winter Press Tour and says that All Elite Wrestling, quote, has over-delivered right out of the gate, end quote. I'm going to leave that right there for a second. That is huge. Now, under the deal, as we said, AEW will begin airing a second weekly show on the network. We're not hearing this kind of praise from USC Network, although USC Network has always been happy with WWE programming in the last 20 plus years off and on that they've been on the air. Cause remember they were on together. What from the nineties, remember USA and WWE has, you know, almost a 40 year history together. More than that, as a matter of fact, off and on. I don't even know if WCW ever got this kind of praise from AOL time Warner or TBS from Ted Turner back in the day. I'm not sure if they ever got that kind of praise because they only had a built-in audience watching to TNT. And TNT was a brand new channel relatively. They needed to try to build things up. And they did. Now, Kevin Riley said this, and this tells you everything about All Elite Wrestling, and this is very good for the rest of the wrestling world, as a matter of fact. So let's bring it up. Kevin Riley, who, by the way, Kevin Riley is not somebody that's uh, to be underlooked. Kevin Riley is a longtime broadcast executive with a lot of success. I just want to give you the heads up because I've watched this guy for a long time, and he's a smart cat. <clears throat> now, this is just to give you the background of Kevin Riley. This is the guy that worked with Tony Khan, and they with their teams collectively went together and made this deal for All Elite Wrestling and to bring Dynamite onto TNT. Now, Kevin Riley, prior to his position at Warner Media, 
He held executive positions at FX, NBC, and Fox. He was actually head of programming at Fox for a number of years. And this guy is responsible for championing successful programs. This is his track record. The Sopranos, Empire, The Office, 30 Rock, Friday Night Lights, The Shield, ER, Law and & Order, and Glee, among others. And this guy's worked on a lot of things when it comes to a younger demographic. In his early years at NBC, he developed Saved by the Bell. He also supervised Law and Order in its first season, a show that lasted 20 years on the air. And then he left NBC to work with Brillston Gray Entertainment, and they are the people that created NBC's Just Shoot Me, News Radio, Steve Harvey's comedy show on the WB, and the pilot for HBO's The Sopranos. And then <clears throat> he was president of entertainment at FX. And this was during the glory years of FX, when The Shield, Nip, Tuck, and Rescue Me were all shows that he was there with at that, at that time. Amazing. But this guy, he was the one that was there as president of FX when that network took off in the early 2000s. Came back to NBC. And that guy was brought back after a long drought for NBC of getting programming back. And what did he do? He brought that network back from poor performance. He created Heroes, 30 Rock, Friday Night Lights, Deal or No Deal, and America's Got Talent. Then he goes to Fox. He created Glee, would be one of the guys that would allow Glee to set, you know, to step off. He's also the person that is credited for the creating the animation domination high definition block of shows that we watch on Sundays on Fox. And he greenlit shows including Empire, Gotham, and The Last Man on Earth, which all performed quite well, 18 to 49. So this guy knows what he's talking about when it comes to the 18 to 49 demographic and getting an audience like that to watch cable. And he decided to go ahead and join in. And he helped to grow channels like True TV, Adult Swim for Cartoon Network. And he's been a trendsetter on TNT. He's one of the first people that started saying, okay, we're going to cut the amount of ads that we're putting on TV. He's the one that helped made TBS become a comedy juggernaut. Like it's got a lot of programming that people watch on TNT. Full Frontal with Samantha B, The Detour, Rex, Angie Tribeca, and The Last OG. Also unscripted shows like The Joker's Wild with Snoop Dogg and Drop the Mic. And here's the other thing, May 2019. This is the important thing to be said as well. And nobody's talking about this on wrestling podcasts. I'm going to point it out to you right now. Kevin Riley, okay, this guy is locked in. So you know how we used to talk about with WCW, how there were certain program executives that were you know, going to be in lockstep with what the network was doing. And then as soon as it was a network change, that's when WCW went and folded. Remember that? You would have never thought WCW would have lost a TV deal. But let me tell you what's going on here. Uh, Kevin Riley, by the way, again, now he came in here in 2014, and he's moved himself up, has made Turner Broadcasting, and Turner in general, one of the world's most innovative co companies. Put it like that. December 2018, his role was expanded to architect the overall I creative identity of Warner Media's direct to consumer streaming platform. So he was working on the digital side as well and became chief creative officer of Turner and Warner Direct Media to Consumer. So this guy is for the future. And in May 2019, at the same time he was negotiating with Tony Khan and made the deal for All Elite Wrestling, signed a new four year deal with Warner Media. He will stay with the company through 2022. So he's going to be around. Should be 2023. And he will expand his oversight to work on True TV, TBS, TNT, and HBO Max. This is how you lock up a deal. This is how you know that AEW is here for the long run. It's not going anywhere. First year success. They did it. They did it. And now... The ire and the angst and the vitriol and the derangement 
of wrestling Twitter is going to be unfathomable because establishment WWE fans are now going to be upset that this grassroots movie, regardless of what you want to say about, oh, Cody and the Elite and how they got brought in together, a bunch of wrestlers putting this show together, and it's all Indie League and all this crap. Well, you know what? They were able to successfully win over their broadcast partners. And most importantly, let's talk about the deal itself. Kevin Riley falls along and talks more about this. Well, actually, not Kevin Riley. Dave Meltzer actually brought up the story about the whole deal of what's happening with Dark and Dynamite and the actual contract. So the second AEW series is going to be Dark. Kevin Riley told Tony Maglio. It will be on TNT. It will be weekly and maybe not 52 times a year. There's not a weekday night, a weeknight for, but obviously Dark is currently a Tuesday show on YouTube. From Fivefold.com, they're reporting what Dave Meltzer of the Wrestling Observer said of the deal that was put in place for this extension. So the deal is extended through 2023. The deal will be a four-year deal worth a total of $175 million. The deal is reportedly as an option on the fourth year for a significantly increased price. So after three years, depending on the performance, it can be picked up for a fourth year and the price will be increased. Say to everybody out there, when it comes to the overall view of what we have now, overall of AEW and where it sticks with WWE, well... AEW, in terms of its ratings, has solidified. The start of this year has been good for them. When you look at the ratings, and this is because the NXT did not start taping, uh, did not start doing live shows until later on. So at the moment, AEW Dynamite in its first two weeks has already pulled off 967,000 and 947,000. NXT on a taped show, 548,000. 721000 for the second show of the year. So the holidays changed everything up. And obviously with NXT, whatever kind of resonization they had from the Survivor Series and the, the lap over of WWE main roster talent coming on to the NXT show, that has kind of subsided. And now we're at this point. And so you got to say to yourself, okay, is NXT doing what it needs to do to help build itself back up. It doesn't need to be doing more than what it is. At the moment, NXT, they're not hot shining shows right now. Like they did have a contenders battle royal for the women. You did see I mean, some good matches tonight. But again, they're not over the top building hop shop booking everything. They're not doing that so much. And that's not a bad thing. So the thing is, is that WWE fans are going to continue to be upset and pissed off. Only because, look, AEW is getting a lot of positive news and a lot of positive feedback from what matters. They have a cult fan base out there. There's not a question of that. And the fans don't like them. We understand that part. But it's basically, the fact of the matter is, what WWE fans and what WWE does, AEW doesn't care about. Because that's the most important thing that's got to be said here. Okay, really, have you seen anything lately on the programming that really are shots back at WWE? Not really at all. I don't see them. If they are, they're pretty vague. They've done a very good job of building stars. The inner circle is becoming something that's pretty strong and solid. I think they've done a great job of building up John Moxley. I think he's becoming a bigger star than he was in WWE. I think Maxwell Jacob Friedman, MJF, is becoming a big-time heel. He is so over. Sammy Guevara the same way as part of the inner circle, who I didn't think would get so over, but he is. And there's a certain gimmick of things that are going on. They are still with room to improve because we already know People keep shitting on the women's matches, and they have a reason to. I can't knock them for that. Brandy Rhodes working tonight with Chris Statlander. I think Statlander's got some upside to her. 
and the Carl Sheet is really not not definitely not that bad. You know, the women's division there needs to be some work. I think just somebody needs to be over there to help structure that out. Otherwise, the tag team division is very solid. Singles division is very solid. They got a good championship division right now, working on titles. If they were going to bring on a new title, that's good. They have not been going crazy with plunder. They're they're really trying to not be WWE, and they're. They're, you know, they still need to go and build some stars in terms of like trying to get the dark order working off the ground. But nobody's complaining the last few weeks. I think the two weeks off or the two weeks away really helped things out. And again, AEW is building its own identity and it's starting to have an identity and I'm really enjoying it. I like the Orange Cassidy best friend stuff. I think they don't use enough of Santana Ortiz. It's they've kind of been in the background a little bit. Oh, AEW is doing a very consistent job with their product. And I don't have a problem with it. But everybody wants to nitpick and go granular on every little detail that AEW does. If you are a diehard establishment WWE fan, because you feel offended, you feel betrayed in, in a way, you feel incensed that your promotion, that you promote, that you follow, the major leagues, remember? You're not happy that they're not doing, they're not getting the momentum right now. When in fact, WWE right now is in a quagmire. Paul Heyman and Vince are trying to do what they can to try to do things a little bit better. But again, without making some major shakeup or changes, they're just going to stay where it is. Now, the ratings that happened on Monday night, the fact that Raw took a dump to 2 million viewers overall, average 2.2, 2.0, and 1.8 were the uh, average million viewers for the three hours. They went up against 25 million people watching the national title game, the National College Football Championship. Can't do much with that. But after this, they can kind of basically get themselves back up to around 2.4, 2.5. Maybe they can do some things to really build things up. Now, for as much as I enjoyed Brock Lesnar interacting with R-Truth and R-Truth just playing the comic role with amazing timing, I mean, it was just funny as shit there was. That's not the best use of Brock Lesnar. And the reason it is is because they keep bringing Brock Lesnar out and they can cut promo after promo after promo. And you can start kind of showing, oh, look, who's coming out to talk to Brock Lesnar? Oh, look. Here comes AJ. Here comes Randy Orton. Here comes Drew McIntyre. Here comes whatever. But again, what some people are starting to talk about now is John Cena's coming back. People are saying the hint of John Cena coming back to win the title 17th time. He's going to be the one to come back to face Brock Lesnar, which I don't know where anybody has that story from that anybody says that John Cena is coming back. I haven't heard about it. The only thing I've heard about John Cena was some other movie work that he's been doing. He finished up a movie that uh, that was being promoted, uh, The Fire, whatever it was, Playing With Fire, I think it was. Which I don't think it did that well over the holidays. But And he has a new girlfriend. Other than that, he's got other projects. I don't know he's going to – I don't even know how he's going to have time for wrestling. But they could definitely use him to come back. They could absolutely use him right now to come back, and, you know, it would help things out. But again, part-timers like John Cena is not going to be the answer, not the end-all, be-all. So what else do we have? Again, there's no real excitement over anything new and big of returns or comebacks or storylines that are huge that are building things back up. Do we see anything right now? Ask yourself that question. Do you feel feel anything right now that feels like that? When you look at SmackDown – And the state of what WWE is doing right now and the way things are going. I mean, you can look at what we have every week. And I haven't done this in a while, but let's go ahead and do a little run through of what the current storylines are. And the current build of WrestleMania, which starts with the Royal Rumble. Who are they trying to get positioned to be looked at when they get to the Royal Rumble match? Who's going to be important? Now, you're going to see a couple of squash matches. You're going to see some glorified squash matches to see certain stars that are going to get built up better. Got that. Okay, Miz and Morrison coming back. And John Morrison, he's just now paired up as a tag team guy. Nothing about Slamtown. 
Nothing about his title runs an impact or lucha on the ground, which I don't expect it. That's fine. But let's be honest. Johnny Impact or Johnny uh, Lundo, he was a main event star everywhere else except WWE. But now he comes back here. Now he is 40 years old. So, I mean, how much more can he do outside on the road? I mean, it would be nice. I'm sure Taya Valkyrie would have loved to go and be able to go and see her hubby on a regular basis. But John Morris is going to try to make another long run. You know, at his age, he's, you know, not going to be able to go and hit all the moves that he can. So he has to kind of build himself up. He has to do something else because he's working on the road so hard to make the money he's been making. And he's been doing movies and things like that. So he's been very active. And he's done quite well outside of the company. But I think getting one more run in WWE would probably be good for him. I don't think they would ever put the belt on him. Maybe they could put a secondary title, but I don't think they would ever put a world title on the man. They never did before anyway. So he got to win world titles everywhere else except here. And that's fine. But whatever he did before... It's not going to matter here. Again, they're just going back right to what, 2010 or whatever, back to Miz and Morrison. And for the Miz, they're never going to they're never going to elevate him up to a main event level. They've obviously made that point. He met his wife in the company. Miz and Maurice is the example, much like Daniel Bryan and Brie Bella. You know, you got all the fruits that WWE is going to offer. You got some taste of titles early on. And it doesn't matter if you're going to be the main event anymore. You're always going to have a steady job there. You're going to make great money. You met your wife there. You got your family built up. WWE has done everything for you to build a life that coincides with wrestling. That's it. And for some people, that's all that matters. There are some of those that are within WWE that are not driven to go somewhere else. Because if there was, I would imagine Daniel Bryan could have considered bolting out of the company and saying, okay, I'm going to go back to Ring of Honor. I'm going to go somewhere else. I'm going to try to get my Ring of Honor brand back, help my old company. But he's not going to do that. The Miz, all he knows is WWE. So there's no reason for him to go anywhere else. And I think he's just content with what he's been doing so far. And that's fine with him. So that's what we start off with the SmackDown was that. Okay, let's move along. What else do we have that's big time, monumental, epic storytelling or character building on WWE main roster programming? Okay, let's move along. Mandy Rose Alexa Bliss. So Mandy and Otis, it's very cute. It's very sweet. I can't help it, man. I am rooting for the big man. To get close to Mandy Rose, because we are all an Otis inside, okay? I'm not going to say I'm not. Hey, man, I'm a big guy, so I can appreciate Otis and the character they're building with him and what they're doing with him. And look, it's getting him over. So I can't knock that. Listen, Otis has been great. I mean, he is carrying Tucker, and, and heavy machinery means something because of Otis. Like, they found somebody that, that, that just really stands out, and the crowd is into it. And I, I like what they're doing with Mandy Rose and that. And I think it's a cool little thing they're doing. I like that. Lacey Evans. I got to tell you, I am winning. She is winning me over. This babyface role, I haven't said much about this, but I really, really like what they're doing with Lacey Evans. Not so much sassy Thunder Bell stuff. She's just, she's a mom. She's a working mom. She's a tough, tough chick. Marine, come on, man. Like, when you look at the background of Lacey Evans, how can you not love this woman? I mean, really, it's working. Lacey Evans could be a monster baby face, even bigger, and could outgrow what Bailey could have been. And I will say that Bailey coming in as the heel here, after all that time in the hugging role, to evolve that character was not a bad thing. They just haven't done much with it. But we know the story really is Sasha Banks and Bailey getting involved here. That's not bad. I actually kind of like that. I, I really don't mind that at all. So keep working with Lacey Evans. She could definitely get built up to be something better. It's still too soon. I mean, you did try to go ahead and push her so hard as a heel and it didn't work. And then you had to bring her back to a certain level. But this is a good feud. 
seeing Lacey Evans and Sasha Banks, that's not a bad feud. And that could be a standalone feud for women's for the women that could go on from Royal Rumble all the way up. So you could start something off within the Royal Rumble, have those meet, meet each other in the ring during the match as competitors, and then work that up until WrestleMania. You could definitely build something really big with that. Braun Strowman is a waste. He is Big Show. Like Big Show's now on Raw. SmackDown's Big Show is Braun Strowman. It's a shame. They've ruined him. And I don't know what you do with Braun Strowman now to bring him back up, but he's a certain level, but he is a Big Show. Now, part of it is that Braun Strowman just cannot cut promos. We know that. I mean, he was kind of okay with Tyson Fury, and they needed a big guy to go up against a big guy, and that's the last time Braun Strowman has mattered. And that's it. Because there's not much else you could do with Braun Strowman. I think the only thing you could do with Braun Strowman is if you company him with, say, you know, a manager. And just make him a monster. And you do something else with him, but this isn't going to work. And It's too bad, but they have really messed things up with him. And Shinsuke Nakamura, I think he's just biding time until he gets to go. But he's IC champion. He's getting to do something a little bit with that, which is good. You know, it's interesting where Paul, I think, is. He is instrumental in where we're seeing certain stars, uh, the ethnic persuasion. They're the ones that are holding belts when you see Andrade holding the U.S. title or you see Shinsuke Nakamura holding the IC title. There is something to be said about that. And you're seeing a lot of diversity anyway, which I think that is one thing that's being done which, you know, you're really, you're accentuating the fact that you have a multi-ethnic, multi-diverse roster of stars from around the world. So it's not a woke thing. It's just a diverse thing just to show, hey, look, look at all these stars. Everybody has a chance to become a WWE superstar. And there's all these different types of superstars encompassing every part of the world, which is the types of athletes that you don't have anywhere else. Let's look into the Usos returning. This is nice to have. Now, I don't know if they're going to be allowed to do a whole lot, maybe win the tag team titles again, but again, they've definitely made a little change to their character. And after some injuries and another run-in with the cops, you know, the Usos definitely have tenure here, but I don't know if they have a lot of trust to do a whole lot with them because of the fact that they have gotten... Either one of them have gotten in some trouble and they've had some issues with them. Things like that. And of course, you also have that whole triangle because Naomi is involved with one of them, married. And so you have that going for you. And Tamina's there. And like, there's just the whole thing with the Samoan family. So it's not that they're going to go anywhere else. They're not going to go anywhere else. We know that. King Corbin is... I mean, they haven't put together and... There's just not much there. I mean, yeah, the bloodline, they got now Roman Reigns working with the Usos. And Corbin's got his henchmen together. But, you know, Ziggler and Rude feel irrelevant to me. And King Corbin, I just don't like what they've been doing with him. This whole feud with Roman Reigns, they've definitely tried to build it out to build it out. And listen, I should not be saying that. Because what Paul Heyman has actually been doing is he is trying to intertwine other characters. So it's not just one-on-one feuds. He's trying to bring other people in the mix so that we have at least a little bit of semblance of some different changes in feuds and matches. I get that part, which is why we see Corbin associated with Diglin Root. And then we see Roman Reigns associated with the Usos. And I can appreciate that part of things. And we look at Nakamura, he has Sami Zayn to kind of deal with things and Cesaro and all this other stuff and what they were doing with Strowman. Okay, I get that part too. You see a little bit of overlapping arcs and storylines that I think I at least appreciate. They're not real in depth. They're not Tessie, Tessa Blanchard, Sammy Callahan in depth. Okay. They're not Cody MJF in depth, right? But those are the kind of storylines I like, or there's a whole lot behind it. Like Cody and MJF tonight, there's a whole lot behind that. I mean, you've got stipulations, you got a definite feud, the mentorship, all that's been told 
pretty extensively and very vividly for everybody out there. There's a lot behind that storyline. And again, with Cody and MGF, a whole lot of pieces. Butcher, Blade, Bunny, Wardlow, right? And then Cody's got the Nightmare family. He's got DDP, and he's got, you know, Dustin, and, and more to that. So there's a lot to be said there. And WWE is trying to make the effort. But you got to ask yourself, I mean, how important are Ziggler and Rude? They've kind of just sat back there. Their tag team has been around, but they've kind of just fit, sat there and not done much with them. They've kind of just not been, you can definitely tell, they're so second-handed here. They're not at the level of Corbin. And it feels bad that it's not younger people that are with Corbin that are just easy to manipulate. But for whatever reason, there's not much sense to see how Ziggler and Rude benefit by being around King Corbin. They haven't really explained that too much. Yourself, is it really making too much of a difference? I mean, New Day, you're going to probably have Miz and Morrison to deal with at some point. There's that too. But really, you ask yourself, what is much there to be talked about when it comes to SmackDown and what they have right there? See, there's a, a symbols of some storylines. And obviously, they also have shelved Wyatt and Brian for a little bit. They're not making that the biggest focus all the time. They have a little bit here and there. But it's not like we're seeing those guys in the ring all the time. So there's a little bit back and forth. You know, the way that they're presenting things are a little different. And that's not bad as well. You look at the Raw side. Okay, AJ Styles, Randy Orton, Drew McIntyre positioned in a triple threat to show, okay, one of these guys is a Royal Rumble top four guy, right? And they could all be in that spot. And I think that's really one of the position. But then when everybody sees Drew McIntyre win in this match, well, then everybody's all over the saying, well, Drew McIntyre is going to take on Brock Lesnar. That's, not, that's just not said. Drew McIntyre will win the Royal Rumble, and he will take on Brock Lesnar. Really? And now I see people with false hope starting to try to build up uh, Drew McIntyre as the next, the next hype. So all of a sudden, after all this time, <clears throat> the former Drew Galloway, who was a champion in Impact Wrestling and has worked other places, and, you know, build himself back up. And all of a sudden, Drew McIntyre, who was like, oh, he was part of the three-man band. You know, he was a uh, nobody. The former chosen one, remember? And nobody really gave a shit about Drew McIntyre, even when he did come back. Oh, look, he's back at NXT. Look at this. And then he just kind of just went back into the lull. You know, they had Ziggler and McIntyre, and they started pairing them up, and there was no more singles competitor. And then they put them together with Elias and Corbin on that side, remember? So, oh, and I remember he was also paired up with Shane McMahon. I'm like, oh, boy, this is fun. And McIntyre was just lost in the mix for a good year. And so all of a sudden, we're seeing him have matches with, I forget who he was taking on. Wasn't he taking on, like, Ricochet and, like, Cedric Alexander and types like that? And then all of a sudden, like, this guy's had such big matches that, oh, we're going to just see him now elevated immediately to the top to take on Brock Lesnar? Come on, guys. Don't really, please do not go and put yourself up to a spot that you think, well, we got to make somebody the next, you know, christened guy that Wrestling Twitter will, you know, endorse as the next top guy. Just because he's done a little bit to his change of a character as a baby face, kind of being a little more snarky. Well, that's nice, but that doesn't mean he becomes automatic fodder for Brock Lesnar. What do you think the bookers in WWE is going to do? You, th you think they're going to get him the title after that? <clears throat> you think they're going to make him look like he's going to be big enough? Look, they brought him in strong, and he did get a win over Kurt Angle. But then after that, they did nothing else with him. And obviously, Paul Heyman really does want to do something with Drew McIntyre. But you got to build something off of Drew McIntyre to get there. A little change of character and some matches that he wins doesn't make him, you know, a reasonable opponent for Brock Lesnar yet. Because you got to remember, look at the guys you had that have taken on Brock Lesnar recently. They're all former champions. Drew McIntyre has never gotten that high up the rank. He never took a main event title. He's never really been a main event guy at all in his entire career in WWE. 
Now, he's been champion, <clears throat> and it's not as if whatever he did at Impact Wrestling is going to matter here. No, of course not. You think the you think TNA and the record he had there that gives some credence to him here? No, but people, as they always do, oh look, he did so well on TNA. Maybe they're going to give him a little more of a rub because he's coming back to work with them again. Do you really feel like that? By the way, Orton doing the Styles class was actually really cool. I really enjoyed that. Moving on, Ricochet means nothing. Absolutely nothing. Whatever they're going to do with him before, whether whatever they were going to do with him before, listen, he's a he's a U.S. title kind of guy. You know, he could go up against Andrade or whatever you want, but he is a secondary title kind of guy. They want to make him the second coming of Rey Mysterio, but Ricochet does not have the charisma, nor does he have the edge factor to become the Rick, to become the Rey Mysterio of this type. And I don't see Humberto Carrillo having that either, because the guy just doesn't have the language, doesn't have the speaking, doesn't have the talking either. It took a long time for Rey Mysterio to get there, but Rey Mysterio is a different type of cat. I don't think you can replicate a guy like that. Now, Becky Lynch. When you look at the contract signing that he did, which of obviously another, oh, let's throw the table over, da-da-da-da. Contract signing is so, so played out. <clears throat> and now, Asuka... You know, the Japanese stuff, that's actually kind of fine. Kyrie saying poking with the umbrella, that was kind of funny. And then everybody all of a sudden got really big into what Becky Lynch was saying after she got beat up and got thrown out of the ring at the hands of the Kabuki Warriors. Sprayed with a mist and all of a sudden becomes battery acid in her face as she is just screaming in pain that it hurts so bad. When I don't remember everybody else doing that. I just remember people being blind. But for some reason, this actually made her face burn. Now, paraphrasing what Becky Lynch says, she gets the microphone and being so out of it, out of sorts, she comes up and says this scripted promo. The awards and acclaims are just poising for someone who likes to fight like her. She talks about how Asuka is the most dangerous woman she's ever faced. Goes on with threats and says if she has to go down with uh, go, go down again to Asuka at the Rumble, she's going down swinging and she swears to God she will take Asuka with her. All right. Like the way she said it <clears throat> was so contrived. But people were praising the shit out of this. And I'm like telling myself, man, do we really want to go that route? Does it really feel like that was really everything to be said about that? When they give you awards, money, and acclaim, it is poison for someone who fights for a living. I don't even know who says that. But it, I mean, people felt like that was really a, a big thing that she says. <clears throat> and the way she said it. Now, the whole idea was, according to Jason Powell in his review on ProWrestling.net, was to make Asuka look like a bigger deal <clears throat> because Becky Lynch doesn't need any pumping up. You know what? I'm not buying it. I'm not into it at all. <clears throat> I mean, people want to go and say what they want to say about it, but I didn't feel much about it at all. And then we went to Bobby Lashley and Rusev. So... After the TLC match, we get another confrontation with them. Liv Morgan gets hit with soda, this time, at the hands of Lana. And I will admit, Lana is getting pretty good at this heel character. I think she's starting to get over with it. I mean, she's starting to find herself. As soon as she started getting away from always talking about Rusev and the whole like sex, sex, sex thing, and now she's just turning into a conniving self-centered bitch i'm enjoying it more and now i'm seeing bobby lashley kind of fighting it back i'm actually starting to enjoy that a little bit so the interaction between those two is getting better and the person that's losing the most out of this rusev so lashley wins and rusev doesn't matter as soon as this feud is over rusev will mean nothing Absolutely nothing. I think Bobby Lashley is the guy that we're trying to get over, but Lana's also getting over as well. And I think those two together 
that's going to help build Bobby Lashley up. Because they always want to have somebody with Bobby Lashley. They're not going to let him go stand alone. And that probably makes sense. So this move here with Lana is actually working. I'm starting to believe it actually goes somewhere. And I think with, with all the time and all the effort they've been putting into Lana and Bobby Lashley, I think Lana, if you put her in as a kind of a manager with other people in her stable, with Bobby being her main guy, that could work more. Or, you know, just something to work like that. I can see that working. So I see Lana and Bobby actually making themselves step up. They're, I think they believe they're elevating a little bit more than you to be a, a surprise to see. TV feuds, which again, they're not going to be anything to the WrestleMania overall setup. Okay. So we can look at Alistair Black, Buddy Murphy. We can look at Charlotte Flair, Sarah Logan. And it's not going to make much of a difference. And Eric Rowan doing the constant thing with the thing in the cage doesn't make much of a difference. Now, Seth Rollins' AOP is a good idea. But there's not a whole lot of faces you have right now on either side. <clears throat> now, on SmackDown, you definitely have Roman Reigns and Daniel Bryan. But really, who do you have as a solid baby face on Raw that could A, go against Brock Lesnar and... B, go up against Seth Rollins. And really, you got to ask yourself, where are you going to be with that? And then which tag team are you going to have that's going to go up against AOP? Like, there's just a lot there that's not being said. Street Profits are kind of lost in the mix, and they're starting to get contrived as shit right now. Like, they're not as organic, and Montez Ford sounds like he's pushing it. He's trying too hard now, and it doesn't feel as good. And people are not so into it with the narration anymore. I think they're kind of off of that. Because I think you just can't bring them back over to start doing the same bullshit they've been doing when you've already had them in the ring. I think that's kind of done. And it's not something they need to keep doing anymore. It's just not working now. Not for what was working before. So they need to make some changes with that. That's where I feel like things need to go. So a few of the other things I want to bring up before we get to the end of here. And wrap things up. Okay, so coming up is a pretty interesting uh, setup of pay-per-views coming up in about a week and a half. <clears throat> so NWA will be presenting Hard Times January 24th. And then WWE will be presenting NXT-style Takeover Worlds Collide, which is the UK and the main NXT together on matches, which will be interesting. So far, in terms of hard times, we're seeing the help of Ring of Honor. For the help of Ring of Honor, NWA is kind of working together on some stuff where Nick Aulis will take on Flip Gordon. Now, there's nothing more than that, nothing where the world title can be on the line. And then we're going to have the eight-person world TV title tournament that goes on as well. And there's a few other matches I'm sure they'll have. Worlds Collide already has a pretty full setup of matches. Undisputed Air will take on Imperium, and that was set up from the NXT TakeOver UK that happened this past weekend. Rhea Ripley will take on Tony Storm for the NXT Women's title. Finn Balor will take on Ilja Dragunov. And the Cruiserweight title will have two NXT UK superstars that will take on Isaiah Swerve Scott and Angel Garza, and Swerve Scott won in a match in order to get himself set up to go ahead and, and in a in number one contenders match from tonight's NXT to get himself into that match. And DIY re-teaming together. So after all this, roughly two years from Ciampa and Gargano being together, to falling apart, to feuding like crazy together, to rejoining each other, reuniting. Interesting way how they did that. And the and what's interesting is the NXT crowd totally is good with it. In other words, Ciampa has gone from face to heel to face. 
<clears throat> just like that. It's a very interesting turn of events, and Gargano's basically stayed the same way. And what's interesting with Gargano is he came, he will just stay in the same spot. And what also looks interesting is that, like we said, we know NXT is where Tommaso Ciampa wants to stay. And pretty much Johnny Gargano, I guess, will not leave after that either. That's what it looks like after all said and done. So it's really interesting all that they're doing. Everything in the house being all set up. I have to watch Regan Monitor Center Stage because I heard some new things from there. And our Marty Skrull was part of that. Obviously, the NWA inclusion probably would be something that Marty Skrull might have helped to uh, facilitate. As we know that now that the word is Delirious and Hunter Johnson will continue to book and be the lead booker of Ring of Honor, but Marty Skrull will now have significant input into the creative what's going on there now. That's what it looks like. And to close things out tonight, I've got to just tell you this. The major independence right now, the other thing we got to make mention of is too, which I should say that right now, is MLW is now working the same way that Impact Wrestling was doing, getting a particular agency to help out and get them where they needed to go with finding a new uh, TV deal. Now, Major League Wrestling has signed a deal with ICM Partners. It's eyeing a bunch of things for their own product. First of all, they want to get a new TV deal, a new streaming deal, so that they're going to move away from being sports. They'll move away from YouTube, most likely. I don't know if that'll be all together. And they're launching a studio. So here's what's happening. This is what's being said. Deadline.com reports this is also today in the news. Actually, this was yesterday. TV rights for MLW Fusion will be available this spring. ICM Partners will also represent the MLW Studios, a multi-platform media studio focusing on original scripted and non-scripted programming. So Corp Bauer is the person behind this. As we know, MLW was dormant between 2004 and 2017, has risen since the April 2018 launch of MLW. The agency signing comes amid growing appetite for live sports. MLW, which relies on realistic storytelling and targets millennial and Latino audiences, currently airs on BN Sports in English and in Spanish. The league has showed growth of 43% of viewers from 2018 to 2019. Their hour-long weekly Fusion series reaches over 2.5 million viewers on BN Sports. A court bar said, quote, as the only free agent in the wrestling space in 2020, MLW is in a unique position in the television landscape, providing an extraordinary entertainment experience, showcasing some of the sport's most storied and iconic families, embracing the Mexican Lucha Libre culture, and presenting co- original content in a 360 manner. So this is great for them. They want to be impo- they want to definitely be involved. So what we're seeing here is absolutely MLW wants to not be left out. NWA is still working its way to get somewhere where they want to be. AEW has solidified their spot now in the wrestling landscape. They are the solid number 2 promotion in all of wrestling on television in North America. MLW is starting to step themselves up. At the moment, Impact Wrestling would be a distant third. And I believe MLW right now is right behind it. And then I would say NWA is fifth most important. And I'm not including Lucha Libre. uh, I'm not going to include AAA or New Japan. That's not necessarily in the same way. But we're seeing all that right there. And the landscape continues to change. So can MLW secure a TV deal and with whom? And the fact of the matter is when Impact is able to get Anthem Entertainment to go ahead and do what they need to do to get that show off the ground, right? They did what they need to do to get that show in a spot. So, you know, Anthem buying a network to put their show on, that's fine. MLW finding a way to go find their own deal with all the connections the Court Bauer has. He's finding a way to get there. 
NWA in the same vein will eventually get there, and they might find somebody to get a TV deal. But because what MLW is doing, because of what AEW has gotten, you have to imagine NWA is going to be looked at right now, this year. I would say the next 12 to 18 months, we could see them find a TV deal on cable somewhere because it's obvious that cable is starting to look at wrestling as a possible as a possible place to go for real live action content that they could bring on board to try to keep their cable channels afoot and they're willing to spend money for it and they have money to spend. That's pretty important. And I like all that right there coming about. And so we're going to keep an eye on that. So congratulations to AEW on getting the big TV deal, showing they're going to be sticking around for not just the immediate future, but pretty much for good. They are here. They are real life. They're not going away. And now is the focus of what WWE decides to do next. Because NXT has not been able to hold off the momentum that All Elite Wrestling has right now. What are they going to do next? Now that when a second show comes in, what will WWE decide to do then? And we don't know when the new second show is going to start up. We don't know when AEW Dark is going to get started and where it's going to get put on the lineup. But we know it's coming. And when we decide to do that, <clears throat> we'll know soon enough. And I can imagine the AW Dark is going to get stepped up a bit when they get their programming because they're going to try to get that show ready to go and start building it up, building it up, building it up so that when it gets to television, it will have a good ramp to start on, a good on-ramp. So keep that all in mind there. That's all coming up right here. We're going to continue to chronicle this. And I'm going to see, and we're going to continue to look at what the rest of the fan base looks at the establishment fan base of WWE and what they're going to be saying each week. I don't see how All Elite Wrestling does not win the ratings war again this week and have this consistent near million viewership live. And then averaging up 1.2 million viewers, maybe more. The growth of wrestling on Wednesdays is coming from All Elite Wrestling. And they have a younger audience. It's been proven. NXT is getting, an, is getting an older audience more into the 50-year-old range. So long-time establishment fans and long-time diehard fans are watching NXT. That's where things are. And that's where you're going to look at everything right now. So anyway, we're going to leave it there. Come back with another Wrestling Control program. Next week, another Wrestling Control podcast because wrestling needs us. Thank you for listening to the Wrestling Is Real podcast brought to you by KingOfAmazon.com. Help support the King of Podcasts. Shop now at KingOfAmazon.com.